Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, March 16th, and this is the weekly market update. The disclaimer, anything that you hear or see on this podcast or video is not to be taken as investment advice. I am not a registered financial advisor. I cannot give you personal investment advice. Please do your own due diligence. It's your money. It's your responsibility. Okay, so we had a week off last week uh, due to residual cold, head cold and chest cold uh, issues. We're back still a little bit, you know, probably about 95% back. So appreciate the patience. Uh, I did throw up an interview that I did with uh, Danny at Caps Capital Cause, and uh, I think that went pretty well. Uh, Threw in a couple things uh, for the broader public that we talk about a lot on here, so... Uh, Anyway, here we go for this week. So, uh, you know, we talk about, I've talked about this idea about this competing data sets that show that the economy is doing well when, if you look at other data sets, there's all kinds of cracks forming in the economy. And what I look at is not just necessarily the data sets, because, for example, we've talked about the unemployment numbers that come out of the BLS and how an initial number will come out in the current month. And then several months later, it's revised downwards. Uh, So how accurate are these things and what are they really looking at? But what I look at is like consumer confidence, consumers, what are they doing? What are they able to do? Obviously, this is a consumer-based economy, 75 to 80% of the U.S. economy is based on consumer spending. So Obviously, if people have money, they're going to spend. We've talked about in the past the excess savings, the excess money that people were flush with based on the pandemic response of the government, basically shoving $6 trillion directly into people's pockets through various mechanisms and trying to discern, and I think not really respecting how much money that was, was kind of a, uh, something that I didn't anticipate very well. And so, but I still think that, you know, that's running out. That ice cube is melting, if you will. And so do we know exactly where it's at? No, but we're starting to see things like this particular slide here where you have a record number of people taking early 401k withdrawals. It says share of participants taking early 401k withdrawals due to economic hardship. And this is sourced from Vanguard. And so you're at a record high uh, number of people. So what I, you know, the thing that I have said is if you give a working person money, give them, you know, if you give a wealthy person a hundred dollars or $200 extra a week, something like that, it's not really going to affect their life. They're not really good. They're just going to put it in their money market fund or whatever. They already have enough money. They have, they spend what they want. If you give, you know, somebody gets a raise that's middle class lower middle class working class person they basically if you give them more money they spend they they have the higher propensity to spend in the short term and so when you become accustomed to eating out when you become you go out and buy that new car during pandemic and you know you don't put any money down and you got a you know eight hundred dollar a month payment or what have you you're not thinking about you're just thinking about you know this is you know something i want or whatever and then you know, as that excess savings, you don't feel so flush anymore. You start to, the, you know, even a squirrel does that, right? Squirrel gathers and keeps nuts. So, you know, a person would think, well, you know, I don't have the cash. My credit card balances are going up. I need to take a look what I'm doing. And so in some cases, I think people want to keep the good times rolling. This is what they end up into. Or, you know, things aren't as good in the job market or they're holding two or three jobs or what have you. And so I think this is an indication that things aren't really as good as everybody thinks. And this has been happening um, even like last year since the pandemic, 21, 22, and now into 23, obviously we're in 24 now, but we saw increases in these hardship withdrawals. And so it begs the question, it's just one data point. You can't hang your hat on one data point, but you know this is this is the kind of stuff that intrigues me that says okay what's really going on underneath the surface of what you see in the headline data and i don't think it's as 
as good as 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 many bulls think it is. So we've talked about headline contrarian covers. They're not 100% certain, but when you see them on a major publication like Barron's, it's worth taking a look at. It's worth having your antenna perk up and say, okay, what's really going on? Uh, courtesy of Jesse Felder, pulled it off his Twitter. I was, If I had a, I think this is about a week old, two weeks old, I probably would have put it up last week, but I didn't have the, uh, you know, it was March 11th issue. I would have, I didn't have the, um, the podcast last week. So anyways, it says, you know, you have this cover here, Barron's says bet on the bull stocks look poised to keep rising thanks to strong economic growth. And so, like I said, these things are not, I do take notice of these things. They're not a hundred percent certain, but let's look, there's another tweet that we were able to pull. Somebody did this. They pulled some previous um, data on, uh, you know, what happened at previous Barron's covers. Um, I don't know. I didn't have time to go back and see what happened after this. I probably should have done that and threw in the chart up to show what happened after this Dow 16,000 um, cover. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that if it's on the cover of Barron's, who isn't long that's already you know, who hasn't heard about the bull market? Who hasn't got long that do, that wanted to get long? How many more buyers are there out there? Now, that doesn't mean for a fact that we're at the top. I'm just telling you that we're getting more and more of these flashing red lights to say, caution, caution. Uh, in the past, when we've had these type of indicators, you know, they have shown to be, uh, you know, tops. The same thing at bottoms. You'll see something similar at a bottom with a cover where we'll, we'll say, uh, you know, stocks are never going to go up again, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, a lot of times that can be a bottom. So take this, I'm going to go ahead and save this in my files and revisit it in six months or a year. And we'll see, you know, if this was prescient or not. Another good, um, another good ch uh, chart. I misspelled the thing here. It says, should have say nobody wants to own commodities. Basically, uh, it says commodities are an ever declining proportion of financial assets. Nobody wants to own them. Everybody wants to own. Um, and this has been going on for years. This is like why I'm so bullish on resources. Uh, the underinvestment obviously is the fundamental, main fundamental driver of why I'm bullish. But the other thing is, is nobody cares about commodities. Nobody cares about resources. Um, and this is typical of the things that I like to look at. And I think that the lack of supply growth, the lack of investment, everybody focusing on, you know, the flash, the pizzazz of AI and what have you, financial assets, the financialization of the U.S. economy. No one cares about any of this stuff. You know, what are the underpinnings of that economy, i.e. resources? And so uh, you couple that with the ESG zeitgeist over the last, you know, decade where banks pension funds, insurance companies, endowments were all divesting themselves or refusing to finance new mines, new, 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 new uh, sources of, of resources. Uh, I think that it's all culminating. It's coming to a culmination point where um, we are going to over at least, you know, the next decade in order to fix these, uh, this underinvestment, uh, it's going to take a tremendous amount of catch up. And I think that represents an opportunity. So let's talk about gold, right? Uh, gold's making new highs. Nobody seems to care. People just ignore it, which is what I like to see. This is why I'm becoming increasingly bullish on gold. And we look at like financial advisors, right? So we have this chart here and it's showing you the assets allocated to gold among all book of business for financial advisors, right? So 75% of advisors have little to no exposure in gold, less than 1% the highest level since 2019. So you have 75% of financial advisors have little to no exposure to gold. Here's 2024. Uh, you can see the previous years, though, they've been, you know, going all the way back to 2017. This is what happens, right? Sectors out of favor. People consider it dead. 
There's no reason to put any money into it. And now you're making new highs. And so this new high is telling me one of two things. Either we have trem this tremendous opportunity, like I said on Danny's show, I think the, the gold situ situation is similar to where uranium was three or four years ago. The potential upside is there because no one cares about it. No one's talking about it. It was the same thing in uranium, right? Nobody cared about it. Nobody knew about it. Nobody was talking about it. And then as the price continued to go up, it starts drawing more and more interest. And it just it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Eventually people, you know, uh, get on and start talking about this all the time. It draws more capital in, creates that, uh, you know, self-reinforcing, uh, you know, or that flywheel effect. So it's not guaranteed gold will go up. I mean, but when you look, one thing I want to point out, and I probably should have put the chart up, I'm not super Mr. Technical Analysis, but they have, it's a very interesting technical setup in gold called a cup and handle, uh, where you have, um, it's been developed not over the last year or six months, but over multiple years, you have this cup and handle, and you've broken out on the handle now. A cup and handle over a long period of time like that is a tremendously bullish setup. So again, we have broken higher. Uh, it's not going to be straight up, obviously. Um, and people are just ignoring it. People, financial advisors don't have their people in it. Nobody talks about it. If you bring it up on, if you bring it up on uh, FinTwit or X, whatever they're calling it now, um, most people just, you know, you don't get it. You don't get it, boomer. You know, Bitcoin's the way to go. And I, I have nothing against Bitcoin, but I think that, you know, central banks, which are the main buyers of the gold, of, of gold over the last two years, um, are not necessarily probably going to be placing Bitcoin as their reserve asset in their central bank. They're gonna, this is why this is, you know, I talked about it before because of the geopolitical situation, the way that the world is starting to bifurcate between the old world, i.e. the Atlanticist, Anglo-American, uh, Western European sphere hegemon is losing its power. It's slowly slipping away. It's in terminal decline. I know this is a, this is a provocative statement, uh, but then you have the global East and South rising. And because of what the United States took to basically do, did to the Russians after the invasion of Ukraine, um, that sent a message to everybody else. Okay, confiscating three hundred billion dollars assets. Like I, there's no let's, you know, China and these other countries that are being called antagonists or are on the U.S.'s radar screen as being competitors. Um, they're never going to be able to fully diversify out of U.S. dollars, but I think they're going to do as much as they can to do that. And they see gold as a vehicle to do that. And remember, it only these changes happen at the margin, and even changes at the margin can result in tremendous price increases. And I think that's what's going to happen. It was the worst geopolitical, one of the worst geopolitical decisions the United States ever made was to do that. Um, because, like I said, they've just told everyone else that if you don't kowtow, if you don't do what the U.S. wants, if you get offside with the U.S., we'll just kick you out of the SWIFT system and confiscate all of your assets. And uh, so people are like, OK, well, let me make sure that I'm kind of diversified. I mean, I diversify myself with gold because of the potential malfeasance of the U.S. government. It's <laughs> it's I have nothing against the United States or the people of America, but the U.S. government is not a force for good in the world. It just isn't. And they're doing all kinds of crazy stuff, wild stuff, out of control, chaos, and they are, they're fueling a lot of this chaos. And um, people are going to, like I said, at the margin, diversify out of the dollar. They are doing that. So here's kind of the what we're talking about, this is the gold price. Gold price makes new high as ETF holdings drop. So you have the gold price here making new highs. Typically, you would have gold holdings in the ETFs, the gold ETFs tracking the gold price. But you have this tremendous divergence where you have the gold price making new highs, yet gold ETF holdings are dropping. But how is that possible with the gold price going up? That's because as investors individual, whatever, institutional, whoever's investing in these gold ETFs is divesting themselves of the gold ETFs. That gold 
doesn't just go away. It's central banks, like, like I've talked about before, foreign central banks have had record amount of gold buying over the last two years. That's why you see the gold price moving higher, yet gold ETFs holdings are dropping. And so I think that's the impetus. And I think the whole thing, the impetus is really this, uh, um, like I said, the geopolitical situation that the U.S. Uh, basically, you know, lighting lighting brush fires all over the world and, you know, telling people that get with the program or, or we're going to use every tool in the toolbox to force you military, political, economic, you know, banking, finance, what have you, the U.S. dollar, anything that they can do to uh, enforce what they consider the post-World War II rules-based order, which I have always said is nothing more than whatever benefits the United States and its vassals at that particular point in time. That's, that's the rules. Where are these rules written down? Where, where can we review them? They're just made up as we go along, and they're always to the benefit of the U.S. So I wanted to point this out. Um, again, I like to look for patterns. I like to look at history. Why? It tends to repeat. Not all the time, but it does. So here is the HUI gold bugs index for gold stocks going back to 1975. And here's the ratio of, gold, of the index to gold. And what you see is, is that what we're pointing out here is that we're a, near a record low in the ratio of gold stocks to gold. We're down here to around 0.1, okay? Previous times that we've visited this time, uh, era has been two, two other times, right? It's 1980, right here, and 2015. And so what you will note is in 1980, when we reached 0.1, you see that the gold bugs index went from about 30 to, you know, over 100, right? So 3x move. Uh, these, these are not like, this is just like an index, right? So you're, you're, your leverage, I mean, you probably saw more in individual gold stocks that did high, better, but I'm just talking about the index here. Then you go back to 2015, the last time that the um, this particular ratio was at 0.1, and you had a move, basically a doubling of the index. And so we're down here again. You know, there's been previous times where we've been, you know, at 0.15 or near 0.20. And we've had a tremendous run. So when the, when this ratio is getting this low, and it's been low for a while and trending lower for years, right? For seven years. Okay, so this is unprecedented. Why is it unprecedented? Because of the financialization of the U.S. economy. It's, it's sucked in all the capital. And so, you know, I pointed out last week, I don't have a slide, but I think I threw it up. Well, I put it in the weekly email that I sent out, free email. And it was GMO, Jerry, Jeremy Grantham wrote an article, and he was talking about the valuation levels of the stock market. And he pointed out that with the CAPE ratio, I think for the U.S. markets around 32 or something like that, that's the cyclically adjusted P.E. ratio. Not in the history of the market has a bull market started from this high level of, of CAPE ratio. That doesn't mean it can't happen, but the odds are extremely against you. And so, you know, I'm looking at the odds here. I'm seeing gold break to new highs. I'm seeing a record low in the ratio of gold stocks to gold that in the past has led to pretty good runs in the gold stocks. I don't know. That's why I'm bullish on gold. I look for these patterns. I'm, you know, I'm not that smart of a guy. I'm just an average person. I'm just a guy on the internet. But this doesn't, you know, this is what I look for. People ask me, like, what, how do you look at stuff? This is kind of the data that I look at. And I start seeing these patterns and that there's a historical, uh, uh, pattern developing that has happened in the past and are we in a similar situation yes okay you know my view was which i said and it seems like i was i underestimated the effect of the central bank foreign central bank buying of gold i had said uh during even 2023 that i didn't expect a gold a massive gold rally until uh, excuse me until i saw until we saw the Federal Reserve cutting rates. You know, it's very possible that the Fed's not going to cut rates for longer. It seems, well, it's not possible. It's a known fact. They've been um, higher for longer. And it seems like that might be the case. But why? I mean, can you really cut rates 
with the stock market at all time highs and real estate, you know, just barely starting to pull back. It's near all time highs. You have massive bubbles in many asset classes. And so um, I don't see, you know, and it's interesting to me, at least, that the gold gold price is making new highs when we have, you know, Fed funds rate over 5%. Um, so, you know, this is why forecasting is hard. This is why I look for these patterns to see what has happened in the past. Do I know for a fact that central bank buying will continue? Will more capital come in from central banks to allow for even a higher gold price? I don't know. Um, we will need at some point for other people to come in to really push the, the gold price higher. Uh, and I think, I do think that, you know, unless central bank buying continues, you may see, you know, at the levels that it is, which is around, I think, a thousand tons a year. I can't remember off the top of my head. If that doesn't continue and you don't have the other uh, buying coming in from retail investors, individual investors, institutional investors, um, then, you know, will it be able to uh, maintain its bull market that seems to have entered? I don't know. Um, but it, it's worth taking a shot. And I think with these, you know, you're at a situation where you're looking here over, you know, 50 years of data and you're at a data point that's only happened two other points in the past. And those two other times you had a pretty decent running gold stocks, just pointing that out. So I've been talking about copper. Um, I think I actually talked about Amerigo Resources on here. I don't have it in the portfolio. I did it one time. It's not something I think can go three, five, ten bag. But I do think in a rising copper market, it's a really nice copper producer. They don't really have any mining risk. All they really do is treat the tailings from other large copper miners. And so when copper miners process their ore, they build up these tailings. Um, and they still have residual copper in there. This company has a deal to process those tails, um, which there's probably 50 to 100 years worth of this material, um, and pull out the additional copper. They obviously are leveraged to a higher copper price as copper moves higher. Um, their cash flow goes up. They have paid down a lot of their debt over the last couple of years and uh, now are paying a dividend and buying back shares. So it's an interesting thing to look at. Um, it basically is going to follow the copper price, uh, I think. So it's just a, an idea I threw out there that's probably not necessarily appropriate for the AIA newsletter, but it's just, you know, I think a, a lower risk way and it pays a nice dividend and uh, they buy back shares. So, you know, if you think copper is going to move higher, which I do, it's, uh, it's worth, you know, taking a few shares and uh, see what will happen. Obviously, I think the copper price is going to go extremely higher over the next decade. Um, so do many other folks. Robert Friedland, who's the copper billionaire that's developed many copper mines. We follow him on X. He's constantly talking about this. But anyways, um, copper prices soar to seven-month high on China's plan to cut output. Copper prices soared on Wednesday to their highest in seven months. After Chinese smelters, which process half of the world's mined copper, agreed on a joint production cut. China's biggest copper smelters met in Beijing on Wednesday, agreeing on a symbolic cut in loss-making production without specifying volumes and timing. Shortages have led to intensifying comp competition for mined copper concentrates, causing a sharp fall in income for smelters to decade lows. So that's an interesting data point. I think I have a couple more here. Okay, here's a tweet from Robert Friedland. He's talking about uh, UBS Bank points to higher copper prices. Uh, the tweet from Robert Friedland, UBS has tossed its hat into the copper ring with a bullish report saying a copper supply crunch is unavoidable with price forecast upgrades to 450 a pound next year and 475 in 2026. The change of position was described as the bank pivoting towards a more constructive view on copper since the middle of the last year. We know the market is closer to a fundamental inflection point, quote, unquote. Quote, bottom-up developments have been universally positive with material downgrades to 2024 mine production guidance pointing to limited supply growth, unquote. UBS goes on to say, Following material cuts to mine supply, we forecast a copper deficit in 2024 and a lack of new project approvals increases the probability of a 
protracted period of deficits, unquote. And so the entire green agenda is based on copper, right? Uh, you need copper for all the wiring, for the transformers, all the things, green energy, um, the continued expansion of the global east and south as these populations, <clears throat> excuse me, go through their S curve as more and more hundreds of millions, if not billions of people now are entering um, the beginnings of uh, lower middle class to middle class, their consumption is going to rise. Goring and Rosenzweig talks about this all the time, the amount of per capita copper <clears throat> that's needed uh, in certain uh, to move through, uh, you know, this S curve. I mean, it's tremendous amounts of copper needed just for the normal development that's taking to place in the glo in the emerging markets. And then you put on top of that the fact that the supply is constrained and that you have these, you know, even though I think this ESG thing is pulling back now, <clears throat> um, you still have, uh, you still, you're still going to have residual of that, right? You're still going to have as long as, you know, it's, an, it's inculcated itself into the political, uh, you know, Washington DC slop trough of a constituency that's going to, continue to be subsidized for some period of time and lots of money spent on it. So, you know, long story short, you know, copper is undersupplied and the growth in usage is going up. Hence, you know, expect higher prices over the next coming years. So wanted to point this out, you know, if you've noticed oil has been slowly creeping up um, recently You've had, uh, I think Brent is, uh, let me check here on oilprice.com real quick while I'm talking to you. Uh, yeah, Brent was 85.34 on Friday, WTI is 81. Uh, not sure everybody's paying attention to that. Bloomberg had an article where they said that oil markets face supply deficit on OPEC plus curbs. Um, IEA says, I think the IA also raised their demand forecast for this year. A lot of, like I said, a lot of moving parts in the oil market, right? You have these production cuts that have been extended. However, you had a situation recently in Russia where the Ukrainians have basically done these drone attacks on a lot of Russian refineries. I think five to 7% of Russian refining capacity is down. So, um, that's why you've had gasoline and diesel export restrictions in Russia, but that oil has to go somewhere. And so it's going into the world market, right? So the originally, I think the Russians were going to help comply with some of these cuts. And now, you know, because of the refining um, attacks on the refining, the crude oil has to go somewhere. Can't just, you know, they're not going to turn the taps off. And so you have that, dichotomy but again as i've pointed out before you know i'm watching the global purchasing managers index which is at 50 above 50 now i think the last reading in february is at 50 so a 50 or above reading means global manufacturing is expanding i've talked about the fact that we're in a liquidity cycle a upward new liquidity cycle which we have been in I've talked about the fact that many, many central banks around the world, more central banks around the world are cutting rates than raising rates, although the big the big boys, ECB, Fed, have not. Uh, the Chinese are pumping a lot of money, and there's a lot of other economies doing that. So that would tend to lead to a uh, boost in economic growth and a tendency to drag uh, you know, these commodities higher as more commodity inputs. We've shown that chart before also in the free weekly email, uh, the correlation between as global PMIs uh, go above 50, commodity prices have a tendency to uh, be highly correlated to that PMI number. So we'll continue to follow that. Um, same thing here in oil, you, you know, we have that short, it's hard to have a short term view. Because like I said, you have all these moving parts. But I still think, uh, you know, as I've said before, eventually we're going to because of the un, tremendous underinvestment we're going to have a um higher prices uh in in you know the relatively you know midterm you know 
three to five years, I expect hot, much higher oil prices. I uh, wanted to point this out. This is interesting. Um, I think Italy and Germany, after Fukushima, were the only countries in the world that said they were going to totally disavow nuclear power. Um, I had forgotten about Italy, but I thought this was interesting. You know, the Italian parliament now is calling for investigation into reintroduction of nuclear power. Of course. Again, um, again, and I think, you know, I've, I've predicted before also that Germany will eventually return and turn nuclear power on. It might not be under the current political situation there, but I don't think the current political situation is going to last. Um, uh, I don't think that people like being poor and having higher energy prices. And if they have an ability to vote, they will vote. Not, they won't vote for that. And that's what they have now. Uh, so, um, and I think that even people that, uh, serious people I'm talking about now, that are have big anxiety and worry about carbon in the atmosphere, realize that nuclear power uh, has to be. I mean, no one is talking about what really needs to happen. If you really believe the earth is going to, die we're all in danger then you just have to stop all this consumption and nobody's going to go for that because people have recency bias they can't envision out in the future 10 15 20 years that these people these uh chicken littles if we don't do something now i mean they, they've heard these chicken littles the sky is falling you know crying wolf for so long and nothing ever happens all people look at is like well everything was fine yesterday everything seems fine today more than likely everything will be fine tomorrow. You're asking me to cut my standard of living by 50%. And I mean, people are, and live in Soviet type, uh, you know, block apartments and be in 15 minute cities and, you know, not have vacations and fly. No one's going to go for this. There's a small minority of people that actually believe this. The average person isn't going to go. So they have a democratic outlet. They're just going to throw these people over the side in the, at the polls. So, uh, this is really what needs to happen. As I've said before, the history of the history of energy transitions for mankind has been to go from less dense power sources to more dense, more energy dense. And that's nuclear currently. And that's what's happening. And that's why another reason why I think that you should be tremendously bullish on uranium uh, and nuclear power in general. Here we go here, why Amazon is paying $600 million for access to nuclear power. And I'll, where there were articles that I pulled these from, I will put those in the in the show notes below the video. So you can go read the articles yourself and come to your own conclusion. This is interesting. Amazon Web Services is paying as much as $650 million for a data center campus adjacent to a nuclear power plant in Pennsylvania. The cloud provider reportedly plans to build several data centers there, according to the information. The site was previously attracting interest from other cloud providers, seeking adequate power to fuel AI computing. While AWS's deal wouldn't be the first time providers turned to nuclear for additional power for AI, it does represent the first campus with direct nuclear power access. The deal underscores the computing dilemma of AI. Since about 2010, Data centers have consumed an estimated 1% of the global electricity produced, according to the Wall Street Journal. But the computing needs of AI, particularly NVIDIA's graphics processing units that require substantially more power than regular chips, could substantially bump up the proportion of power used. A researcher from, I can't pronounce this, university in the Netherlands, projected that as a result of AI, the amount of energy needed to power global data centers could jump by 50% by 2027, according to the Wall Street Journal. So we know this is happening. And so is nuclear power, is this a provocative statement? Is nuclear power a way to play AI? I think so, right? Because it seems like this is where we're going, more and more data centers, more and more power consumption, um, again, uh, no, you know, they do have these things, they do buy renewable energy, and this is the easiest way to do it. You just say, okay, I'm just going to build this thing right next to your nuclear power plant, get a substation that hooks me directly to your substation, and I'm in business, 
And everybody now is moving to the view that nuclear power is low carbon. So you, you're killing two birds with one stone, right? Um, you're having cheaper power, more reliable power, cleaner power, and you know, you're know you touching all the bases. And so is this a one-off? Likely not. Is Do we know for a fact that energy consumption for all of this AI is going to continue to grow? Absolutely. And so... Like I said, maybe this is a stealth way to play AI. It's just another feather in the cap of nuclear power. And another reason to be bullish for a longer, more um, a higher uranium uh, market over, over the years. So I wanted to point this out. I've been talking about Namibia, offshore Namibia, the success that Shell has had there, the success that... She Total has had there with the Venus well. And now you have this um, Portuguese oil company called Galp. They have hit a, quote, significant column with high quality light oil in Namibia area PEL 83. Um, appraised target is the same pressure regime as a successful Mopani 1X, which Galp described for pressure porosity and permeability as, quote, very encouraging. So this is from Tommy Deepwater. This is a guy I follow, person I follow on Twitter. Um, all things offshore oil, pretty good. Uh, he puts out like this weekly uh, news thing. That's pretty good. If you're interested in offshore, I would follow him. Uh, he goes on to say, great news would be surprising if Gallup did not develop PEL 83. It's in shallower water than Total's Venus. Namibia just getting started. Exciting news for EMP as well as floating rig and OSV demand. Yes, indeed. And of course, we have all those bases covered in the actionable intelligence alert newsletter. Um, we follow, we're very bullish on um, offshore oil and gas suppliers and vendors and contractors, boat, OSV boats, rigs, subsea suppliers. And uh, we actually have a position in a company that has significant or has, I wouldn't say significant, but has material uh, interests in many, many blocks in Namibia and the entire Orange Basin, which encompasses Namibia down through South Africa. And I have been on record as saying, and I continue to say, and this news is clarifying that view even more, that I think offshore Namibia is going to actually be um, have the potential to rival Guiana, what has happened in offshore Guiana, and maybe even surpass it. But that remains to be seen. But we're getting the same kind of great uh, discoveries there that we saw early on in Guiana, and you see what's happened there with Exxon, Hess, and some of the other operators there. And I you know, have identified this company that I've been holding uh, that I feel is the management's pretty tuned up. That's a uh, small, or it's a mid-cap. And you know you got a p you got lottery tickets you got a piece of some of these discoveries, uh, you know that they, they don't necessarily have the resources to be a full partner. So what they do is they sell off their interest a certain amount of their interest to the operator like Total or Shell, and then they get a carried interest. Right, carried interest means they have a piece of it and they don't have to put up any more money. You know they they don't don't have the resources to develop. That's why you got to bring in these big national oil companies like in Galp or Shell and Total and these these folks. But again, more positive news. See, the problem is, is though people want instant gratification and these things take time to play out. OK, but the payoffs are so large, if you're right, that it's worth waiting. And so a lot of people aren't interested in waiting. They're just like, well, I've been holding this thing for a year and a half. What's going on? What's happening is the news keeps getting better, better and better. And more capital comes into that, you know, area, um, and the news gets better. And at some point, you hit an inflection point. In the meantime, the particular company I'm talking about that's in the portfolio has producing assets in Nigeria that are uh, very lucrative and has been using that cash flow to pay cash dividend and buy back shares. So in the meantime, you get this free ride with these majors in a developing petroleum um, er area. Uh, that has that's very prospective while your company is cash flowing from producing assets and buying back shares and paying a dividend. So that's kind of like how investing works in my mind. So more nuclear, I got these slides not 
a little bit mixed up, but that's fine. Uh, this was uh, an article that you had to get behind a pay pay window. But anyways, here's the, the tweet from this James Hoff. Southern CEO Womack is talking about the possibility of building more AP-1000 plants in response to soaring power demand in Georgia. Uh, says here, this was a uh, from the Atlantic Atlanta Journal Constitution newspaper. Southern Company talks about more nuclear energy. So, originally, when they were building these plants, I think we're talking about Vodal here, uh, plant Vodal. They were over budget. These were a boondoggle, and now you know we're talking about you know the possibility of building more. Why? Because soaring power. Why? Because of all this AI. Because of all these uh, data centers are sucking up all this power so uh again not just something one just one data point just another interesting news item that's pro-nuclear in my mind so now we're gonna make some political stuff so if you're offended by that this is the time for you to go away and uh turn turn this off because some of these things may not be for you so this was an article from the hill and I talked about this before, and somebody came at me in the comments and said, prove it to me, you know, I live in Arizona, and this is happening, that, you know, so basically, this whole CHIPS Act was a boondoggle. And why? Because I saw the same thing in renewables. When the government gives subsidies, when the political actors are involved, they have other agendas. Their main priority is not the economic outcome. It's a political outcome, Okay. And so the idea was, uh, we're going to, you know, China's our main rival. We can't have all this reliance on them for our chips, blah, 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 blah. So the federal government in a Soviet central planning committee method of thinking decided they were going to appropriate all of this money so that we could build a chip industry here in the U.S. Now, there's a reason why they make the chips in other countries, because they are more efficient at it and better at it, uh, and it's cheaper, okay? Does that necessarily mean that's the best for our, you know, uh, economy and our rivalries around the world? Well, I have a different view on that, which I'm not going to get distracted. I want to focus on this Chips Act boondoggle and why it's not going to work. Because it's not just, here's, 30, here's a bunch of billions of dollars, go build it and run it the best way you know how. They put all these political stipulations in there around DEI and these other things, and it doesn't make any sense. So here's a few snippets from the article. You can read, if you disagree with me, that's fine. You can go read the Hill article, and then you can go into their comment section and argue with them. Uh, I have seen the same thing in renewable energy, okay? We have to comply with prevailing wages and apprenticeship programs, and nobody knows what to do, and it just raises the cost of everything. It makes it harder for people to do things, okay? And you can say, well, there's some merits to doing that. That's fine. You can say that, but it raises the costs. And at some point, if the cost is too high, it's not worth doing it. It's uneconomic. It's totally uneconomic. That's the point. And so there's a lot of midwits out there that don't understand economics. They've never ran a business. They just think that, you know, this it doesn't matter. It does matter. That's why the Soviet Union... And all of these communist countries, because you can't centrally plan and dictate prices, okay, for wages or anything else. If you do, it starts creating distortions. And at some point, if you put enough distortions into, into an economy, it starts causing uneconomic situations and people just walk away. And that's what's happening with this chips thing. So here's a few snippets from the article. The Biden administration recently promised it will finally loosen the purse strings on the $39 billion of CHIPS Act grants to encourage semiconductor fabrication in the U.S. But less than a week later, Intel announced that it's putting the brakes on its Columbus factory. The Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company has pushed back production at its second Arizona foundry. The remaining major chip maker, Samsung, just delayed its first Texas fab. This is not the way companies typically respond to multi-billion dollar subsidies. So what explains chip makers' appearance and gratitude? In large part, frustration with DE requirements embedded in the chipset. In short, the world's best chip makers are tired of being pawns in the chipset's political games. They've quietly given up on America. Intel must know the coming grants are election year stunts, mere statements of intent that will not be followed up. Even after due diligence and final agreements, 
the funds will only be released in dribs and drabs as recipients prove they're jumping through the appropriate hoops. And if you read the article, it goes more into more specific uh, detail of what these hoops are, and they're ridiculous. Okay, and in my opinion, and these companies are not going to do that. They're not going to. Uh, they're in the business of making money. The bottom line's the bottom line, and you can put up with a certain amount of compliance and a certain amount of this nonsense. But if it makes it fully uneconomic, you're not going to do it. These are publicly traded companies, and they have shareholders. They shareholders and the boards won't put up with it. And so even if you're going to give me free money, but put all these attached goofy ideas, to it, it's not worth doing. And so that's what they're doing. That's from the Hill. So uh, this is a respectable publication that I think is kind of, you know, just talks about what's going on in Washington, D.C., uh, linked to the article in the show notes. But this is typical of what happens. OK, anything tied to the government and a subsidy or a giveaway by the government, it's always going to have all these conditions attached. Always. OK. And at some point, like I said, there's a <clears throat> there's a threshold where you just can't comply anymore. And if you do, because it's totally uneconomic, it makes no sense. So they won't do it. So we're talking about here wind turbines and solar panels are aging prematurely, something I've talked about because I've been in this industry. I know what repowers are. I've seen the equipment. I've been in, operated, in operations. I've ran a plant for three years. I see how things deteriorate. These are machines. Entropy is a fact of life. Uh, things tend towards chaos over time. Uh, machines break down. And these things are very, in the course of wind turbines, they are well designed. They are, uh, you know, amazing machines, but they're machines and they're just the amount of stresses on them and what they're, you know, I don't think in, in a lot of the materials are not capable for the stated lifetimes. And now that's what we're finding out. Now we're finding out the same thing in solar. You know, they're talking about in this particular article, something I already know about these inverters. Inverter does what? An inverter takes and collects all of the DC from a certain amount of strings of panels and converts that DC to AC, okay? And then steps up that AC to a higher voltage and sends it to the substation so it can be sent to the grid as AC power because we have AC system here, we don't have DC, okay? And so the inverters are catching on fire, they're breaking down, they're not lasting. Why? Because of heat and humidity. The thing that I was taught when I was going through my electrical training, a uh, formal training, was that one of the main, uh, things that will deteriorate an electrical circuit is heat, okay? Heat breaks down insulation, starts causing problems, causing faults, causes open shorts, what have you, okay? And so if you have an inverter that's already with transformers and windings, it already has a certain amount of heat because of what it's doing, right? There's heat losses in, in, in these steps, okay? Not only that, if you have an inverter sitting out in the desert, or sitting down in the middle of Texas from June to September, it gets hot here, okay? It gets over 100 degrees. You have direct sunlight on this thing. So the heat, this is part of the reason why these things don't last, okay? They, they can't take the heat. Heat causes degradation of electrical circuits. This is, you know, a known fact. And so for a matter of fact, like if you have a battery, uh, a, a best system, a battery storage system, these come in containers, pre-built pre in containers, and they have individual HVAC units. So you have to have air conditioning to keep them cool. They don't have this on inverters, obviously. They're just air-cooled. But this is the problem. So this is what the article, I'll put a link to the article. You can go read it yourself. This is what I, I've been experiencing. I don't have an opinion on it one way or another. This is, these, this is what's happening. You know, Conversely, you can design and build a nuclear power plant that can last 100 years plus. 100 years plus versus 7 to 12 years. Where, where should the capital be going? That's the question. Where is it going to end up going? It's going to end up going to nuclear. From the article, wind turbines and solar panels are not living up to their longevity claims, increasing costs, and filling up waste disposal sites. Inverters and solar facilities required to convert direct current into grid-ready alternating current are failing in 10 to 15 years. 
A new Australian study blames early failure of solar panels and inverters on humidity and excessive heat from the sun, the source of the photovoltaic cells energy generation. Yes, because heat attacks electrical circuits. It's not good for it. You already have heat and latent heat from the conversion of AC and DC, DC to AC. Then you you know have direct sunlight on it. Governments have hastily rushed to embrace renewable energy at the expense of consumers and taxpayers with apparently little insight into some of the shortcomings of the technologies. Exactly. The people making these decisions make their decisions based on political expediency, not necessarily what's best. Eventually, when it becomes, gets to the point where no one can ignore it, then the zeitgeist shifts. And I think we're in the process of that right now. Uh, luckily, I'm at the end of my career, so um, I don't have to retrain for nuclear power. Uh, you know, I'm at the end. I can retire anytime I want. Uh, but, you know, if I was if I was entering, if I was an electrical engineer or mechanical or whatever, I would be going into nuclear. I wouldn't be going into renewables, but everybody's going into renewables. And this is not, you know, there'll be some residual, but I think we're going to find, you know, you know, what do this things just don't last and then you're constantly turning over uh and building you know replacing things that are you know you know when an inverter when a piece of electrical gear fails a lot of times you have like pretty really decent energy releases like fires so these inverters catch on fire these batteries catch on fire <clears throat> combiner boxes catch on fire turbine nacelles catch on fire and so, you know, and then what are you going to do? It's like they mentioned in the article, go out to Sweetwater, Texas. You can see blades piled up all over the place, blade graveyards. And so same thing I mentioned in another um, previous previous uh, video where the estimated amount of waste, solar waste over till 2050 is going to be 40 or 40 to 50 million tons, 40 to 50 million tons tons and people say well we're just going to recycle it okay tell me how you do it because if it was so easy to do and cost effective they would be doing it what's currently cost effective is throw them in a landfill but you're not going to be able to do that 40 or 50 thousand tons million tons 40 or 50 million tons of this stuff that's like incomprehensible so i just don't think this is where we're heading long term i think we went, went through this period over the last 15, 20 years, and now we see what nuclear is doing, especially as they introduce SMRs and things like this, just makes it easier and easier to use nuclear power. Obviously, yes, there's a chance for, you know, what's safe and unsafe, but the nuclear industry has a tremendous record um, of safety relative to the amount of megawatts it's produced. It has the best safety record. And <clears throat> people are just, uh, this, there's a lot of canards out there that uh people don't get and the like i said before the adult person understands that in order to have a modern society with all of the things that we enjoy certain trade-offs have to be made so i wanted to talk about this i thought this is interesting you know my view western civilizations in terminal decline that's i don't want to get too far into that i think this is symptomatic this has just been relentless okay uh basically since you know you want to call it the sexual revolution um things like that you know this has spiritual connotations in my view which i really don't want to get into the facts are that this is just symptomatic um a rather large symptom and result of a lot of the um lack of virtue lack of uh you know spiritual um lack of godliness and uh you can bring in populations from the, from the uh, third world. Uh, they're not, you can see the incompatibility, how that's working out. Um, at some point, a tipping point is going to be reached. These folks that are coming in understand how the system works and they are going to organize politically and you're going to have conflict. And I just don't think that the native populations in the West are up to, you know, they're just probably going to roll over. Um, you know, it's a situation, if you're a native person of Western Europe or the United States or America or whatever, 
and you see all these, I mean, you can read books about and read what happened when Europeans came and took over the United States and the, what they, what ended up happening to the Indians. Um, they were just continually over time marginalized and, uh, you know, as the invading population took over, that's the history of mankind. That's not just, so people say, well, people think we're so sophisticated now we're better than that and we're going to no you're not you're not going to change human nature you're not going to change human nature um i've said it before your skin is your uniform whether you like it or not and people click up based on race and ethnic uh um affiliation it's just that simple um and you can go to you know i know that that's like running your fingernails down the chalkboard for these progressives and liberal people but that's a fact and uh, I thought it was, you know, I've told this story before. One of the Congress people that represented the area around um, the University of Minnesota was a professor there, a Jewish professor, female. And she was a champion of all of this immigration into Minnesota, particularly Somalis. And so the Somali population came. I'm, I'm telling the facts. I'm not giving you a, a editorial. They came. They got to a certain level of um population and then Ilian omar was elected and the other person that had championed all this immigration she was out and i remember reading in the star and tribune that she was shocked she goes i don't understand why i these people didn't like support me i championed them yeah because people click up over race and ethnic nationalistic that's just how it is not everybody I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just telling you what the reality is. And that's what you're seeing in, in now in, in, in the United States and in Western Europe. And it's going to continue. You know, you're probably, you know, this last, I had another chart about immigration where there's no sense in putting it up. You have a wide open border. You have everybody pouring in here basically to feed. They're not coming here to be free or because they believe in Jeffersonian democracy and, you know, all of these things that we were taught or we supposedly believe in or our constitution, they come here because um, they look at it as a gold mine and they want to come in and pull as much meat off this rotting carcass as possible until, until the whole thing implodes. That's And so that's what's going to happen, in my view. Uh, you're not going to vote your way out of this. Even if you elect Mr. Trump, he's not going to do anything. OK, he's not able to. OK, this is already set in motion a long time ago. There's not much can be done. You're not going to vote your way out of it. And uh, I already think that we're in a, we're in a, what shall I say, cold civil war in a cold World War III. Um, and those are my views. And uh, you just see the, you know, the, the degradation like this with this CHIPS Act. You know, the United States can't do anything anymore. Um, we can't build planes. Boeing now every day is having incidents, okay? You saw there was an Al Jazeera film where... Uh, there was a whistle or the guys went into the factory in South Carolina and stuff that you would see like in auto plants in Detroit back in the day that I heard about friends that worked there, people going out on their breaks in the parking lot, firing up doobies, um, lack of quality control, things called traveling work, which wasn't allowed back in the old days of Boeing. So say that a part wasn't right or something wasn't right on the plane, it was continued to move down the line. And somebody, the crew was supposed to travel down the line and fix that later. And that wasn't happening. They never allowed this so-called traveling work. I mean, this guy that was supposed to be a whistleblower evidently committed suicide, although now it's coming out that he said that if I die before my testimony, I'm not suicidal. Conspiracy theorists can run with that. The bottom line is, what what is the U.S. good at anymore? What what are we doing uh, uh to uh, make this exceptional nation that we are. And I don't see it turning around. Um, there's just no will to do that. And so you're in terminal decline. All empires decline. We are an empire. Um, and you see what's happening. You know, this pathetic Macron the other day gives this news conference about he's going, you know, about what's happening in Ukraine. The war in Ukraine is lost. There's actual negotiations taking place behind the scenes. It's going to be a political settlement, okay? And right now, where the Americans and the U.S. are starting, or the American and Europeans are at the point of, we're going to freeze the conflict. And Putin just said when he was interviewed the other day, there will be no freezing of the conflict, okay? The terms will be dictated by Russia, whether you like it or not. 
What, who are you going to send there? The French maybe can send one brigade. Okay. What are they going to do? And uh, you have Macron is like at 12% approval ratings in France. You have Schultz is under 20%. You have Biden at a low. All of these people in the West are at these huge lows. You're going to have European uh, parliament elections in June. So we'll see uh, how the people respond. You have Richie Sunak at like 7% in, in the UK. All of these goofballs and their goofball policies that didn't work, okay, and aren't working, people are tired of it. And that's why you're seeing the the the, the permanent state cracking down on information. Now they got to sell, got to get the Chinese out of TikTok. They're just trying to control all the information. It's kind of like when Princess Leia was talking to Darth Vader, the more that you tighten your grip, the more systems are going to slip through your fingers. You know, so we'll see what happens. Um, I kind of jumped around a little bit there politically, but these does have implications for investment. Do I want to be investing in regions that are in decline? I think that are in decline. And it comes back to the people. The people are not virtuous, okay? They're just materialistic. They don't care. They're, they, they don't, they, they're amb ambivalent. They hate their own history. They hate themselves. They look in the mirror. Well, how did that happen? I was never trained that way, brought up that way. I don't understand how this happened, but it did. And you know, this is what we have. We're not even reproducing anymore. Okay, in the way, in, in in the EU, this is this is heading for extinction. It's just that simple. Okay, that's it for this week, guys. Um, appreciate the support. We're back. We're well. We'll continue, and uh, we'll talk to you next week.